Okay, everyone, welcome to the WebDM School for Delinquent Spells. I'm Mr. Pruitt, this is Coach Davis, and today we're just gonna, we're just gonna, okay, listen, counterspell, I'm gonna need you to stop that. Counterspell, stop interrupt. St stop interrupting me, counterspell. Okay, healing word, sit, sit, sit down, healing word, you're making this fight go on. Way I will too bring long. banishment out of suspension right now. I will use it on, you know what, I just, I can't do that. How are we gonna reach these problem spells, Coach Davis? No, I don't know. We all love spells. We're going to talk about some spells today because um, when it comes to casting certain spells, there's always some bad apples and we can't always rely on Google Chromecast. <laughs> Let's just kind of go through this. Yeah. Because this, this whole show kind of morphed from like one spell yeah, to many. Yeah. One spell to many. And so it began as a, a discussion of, of, of counter spell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and which itself grew out of a discussion that we had during the last abjuration, you know, the show we did over abjuration right, earlier right. this year. Looking at the spells of a particular class, what do they have? What challenges might you face as a dungeon master in, in, in running it. It's pretty clear that there are problem spells yeah. that that keep cropping up again and again on, on various places where people talk about, you know, the, the issues that they have with fifth edition and like the fact that we had even though we had just done like a show on abjuration and talked about counterspell and we had one of our patrons say like, hey will you guys do a show on like why counterspell <laughs> sucks the fun out of the game and you yeah. know the tyranny of counterspell sort of really led me to think like there really are a lot of spells we're not I don't think we're going to be able to get to them all here but we'll get to the ones that are uh, you know those of you on Twitter and Facebook that follow us on those platforms and asked about them uh, you know told us about which ones bother you there we'll at least mm -hmm. try to get to those I define a problem spell as as one of three things it either slows down the game in an unacceptable way mm -hmm. uh, too good to pass up you know, it, it might as why is this a choice? Like, I will always pick this. Why isn't this just given to me? Yeah. You know, uh, and then boring, like spells that are just really boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, those are the three that I have. If I'm always going to cast this spell and always going to take it, then it's it's just too good. I, I, I want more variety, and, I, you know, I'm, I'm... Yeah, these are your shields, your fireballs. Yes, yeah, yeah definitely. Your counter spells, <laughs> your counter right? Spell. And you'll find that they all, like, overlap, right? Like, so, like, slow down the game, a lot of those tend to be boring, you know, because they slow down the game. They suck the fun out, not because they're, you know, not thematic or fun, but just, like, how does this work again? Either because they're not cast very often or the wording on them is mm -hmm. weird or it's open to interpretation. You know, spells like that might be something like Moonbeam or Barkskin, where when does the enemy take damage from a Moonbeam? Is it possible for them to take it like twice in one round of combat? You know, mm -hmm. like there's all these kinds of. Uh, you know, rules calls, and the DM has to like look up the spell, and maybe the players looked up the spell. Especially when you got the the warlock with the repelling blast or whatever. Oh God, yeah, yeah. Trying to push people back and through these these area Zones, of effect spells. Sure. And then based on just reading through uh, Facebook and Twitter from our viewers, I, I I added like two other categories or criteria for what like a problem spell would be, uh, and that's just like how do I even. Like, what is even going on with this spell? <laughs> you know, and, and that slows down the game, right? But it's also like, before you've even tried to put this into effect, you're sitting there going like, I, you know, how do I predict the future with augury? Right, how does one <laughs> take the course of events that are going on? It's a second level spell, right? It, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it's a ritual, or at least we made it a ritual early on. You, know, you don't want to do them a disservice. They're trying to commune with their deity and use yeah. this magic to help them plan. But it's like, the spell really gives you no guidance on how to adjudicate it and run it, and there's nothing in the DMG that offers further commentary either. So, like, I don't know, roll a D4 and make a guess. Like, mm -hmm. that's not very satisfying, though, for a, for a spell. Yeah, because Augur is the, the wheel, woe. Wheel, woe, both or Bo none. Both kind or none. Of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and then finally, the, the last category are just like trash spells. Spells that you just never see prepared or that you cast once and it was mm -hmm. so underwhelming that you just uh, would never, you know, never want to do it again. So... Uh, I'd like to just kind of go through the categories, talk about the spells, you know, maybe if we've got fixes for them, discuss that, but just have a discussion about what makes them problems and ways that we would handle them. 
Mm -hmm. What do you think? I love it. Uh, let's let's. Let me let's start out with those that slow down the game. So we're here. What with augury starting I, out? I say like augury does. Yeah, we we had some uh, some folks on Twitter mention that augury was difficult, mostly because they get uh, augury. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see. Let's mm -hmm. look at the text of augury uh, mm -hmm. itself. Yeah, I got it pulled up right here. It is a ritual. Uh, cast time a minute, but um, it it is you're 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 divining from an otherworldly entity about the results of a specific course of action that you plan to take within the next thirty minutes, and the DM chooses possible omens, wheel, woe, wheel and woe, or nothing. So yeah. to me, straight out, this is literally a codified version of the play players have a plan and they get to sp expend a resource in game to go, is that plan dumb? Sure, okay, right? that's, not a bad, that's not a bad way to look at it, yeah. I mean, you know, in, mm -hmm. in essence, that's all it is, is a meta, it is a meta way for players to go, so we want to storm the castle with these people while they sneak in here, can we, should we, should we do that? Yeah. And the, their god's like, uh, you know, yeah, you yeah. can do it, but in a way, you have to really look at like, wheel or woe to who, you know. Right. I mean, obviously, yeah. they think to them, but you know, if you're asking a god, a god looking at this cosmically might not think that. Right. And I realize like I'm just making it more convoluted than it already is, but sure. like with with regards to whose perception, <laughs> you know, maybe y'all charging in there is is a good thing for the gods because they're sure, like, "Oh, they're yeah, going to yeah. charge in there and screw that up. They're probably all going to die." But you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or maybe yeah, just like, give them the wheel and woe. It'll be fine. I find it hard with this one to not just go, "Well, it's wheel and woe because like if something's wheel, it's like, I mean there's no risk." Mm -hmm. Then that me yeah, that's sort of what it, it implies to me, unless it's like we plan on breaking in here you know, like, I want to know the results of a heist, for instance. You yeah. know, like, if you're about to plan a heist. How does this translate into the game? Part of the ways to sort of fix augury here is, like, a specific course of action within the next 30 minutes. It's not just, like, anything we want to do in, indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So it's very specific. So the DM has maybe a better idea of what it is that the players are trying to attempt. They obviously know what opposition there might be. But the fact that it's there's dice involved, that the outcome is still uncertain... Like, it does put a lot of pressure on the DM to basically either predict it or perhaps even I can imagine DMs feeling the need to alter results in favor of the of what the augury revealed. Maybe that's satisfying, maybe it's not. I'm, I'm not sure I'd find it very satisfying. Um, yeah, no, and it, I, I wouldn't do that. Especially as a ritual, it's like, you're really going to do that every time, then the players might, you know, get, you know, it might become just standard operating procedure to lock that one into place. Through you know through that kind of magic. So oh, and then of course there's a 25 percent chance of getting a random reading if you cast it more than once in a day or once per longer. So this is a spell that like the flavor of it's really cool. You're throwing bones, you're casting auguries, you're you're sacrificing a pig and reading its entrails or something. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, it's got a lot of flavor. But like asking the DM to to predict the future or at least like anticipate future results to the extent that they know what the outcome of a course of action would be. It's like, just, it's tough. So I don't think I would do any of that. I think instead you might say like, what's the result of an augury? You, you cast, uh, you know, looking for signs, importance, and omens, and get something other than like a direct answer. Maybe you get like hanging inspiration or something, mm -hmm. or a certain number of re-rolls, or you get something else, you know, something else that sort of like can convey that I have an insight into the future. I think that even, I think maybe re-rolls would be a good way. It's not advantage. You know, it's kind of like uh, lucky. You no, know. it's kind of lucky or the uh, the diviner's uh, ability. Oh, sure, right. It's a bit like important, yeah. So mm -hmm. it could probably, I think that that may be where I would go with it. And then you get a certain number based on like the level of the spell. I don't really have a lot of people cast this spell. Not a lot of clerics casting augury. Yeah, uh, in the games I've played. So what's the uh, what's the next one that slows down the game? I would say by far the one that we got uh, mentioned the most as slowing down the game are conjure the conjure spells and and by extension animate objects, mm -hmm. um, anything that adds actions to uh, the player side especially is going to slow down the game and the fact that the players have the option to summon up to eight. Uh, a particular sort of creatures. Mm -hmm. um, now there's all kinds of conjuration spells. They come in all sort of flavors and varieties, but sort of the big offenders in this regard are, are conjure animals, because it's a third level spell, right? Yep. You get like eight wolves, I think, with it. CR four, mm -hmm. one or one quarter. That's not nothing. Conjure woodland beings would be another, right? Uh, that gets you the, uh, the fairies that are capable of casting all those spells and the like that mm -hmm. cause so much headaches for people. 
Um, now, does the now, how do you read this spell? Because I think this is one of the things to me that, that kind of sl can slow this down is, does the caster get to choose the exact animal? Uh, now, I, I don't let them choose the animal. I let yeah. them choose how many they want to summon. And then, especially with a you know, database like d and Beyond, you can just like filter the beasts yeah. into the ones, exactly the ones you need, exactly the CR range that you need, and then it's right there. And then like, even if it's not necessarily tabulated with numbers next to them, you can just kind of like eyeball the list and roll a random or mm -hmm. pick appropriate for the environment yeah. or whatever you want to do. Because yeah. I've seen arguments over that. Well, I want wolves. It's we're in the woods. I should be able to get wolves. It's like, well, no, you can you can get one. I, you I, can get one quarter uh, beasts. Yes, you can. Yeah, you can. But get, yeah, you don't. You, you're just summoning. I will tell a player that if you want specific animals, and I, I've, I think we've mentioned this before, maybe in the Conjuration show, that that is a that's a treasure. Being able to specifically conjure exactly what you want counts as treasure, which means you've got to go out and find a wolf that's willing to come when you call it every time. Mm -hmm. You've got to find whether it's uh, a wolf that you found in the in the, the forest, or you traveled to the beast lands in the outer realm. And I was going to say gonna... that sounds like an awesome adventure <laughs> when you go to the beast lands and you got to track down. You got to like, track down eight, the wolf lord. Eight, a wolf lord and be like, I need you and your seven best. Yeah, and this is the deal. And this is how I also solve problems with uh, you know find familiar and others is like because you're summoning the same one, they remember. If mm -hmm. you treat that wolf like garbage, if they are constantly thrown out front and die and have to face these things, then the next time they show up, they might be like, yeah, you conjured us. We'll do what you, we'll, you, know, you'll do what you want, but we know that you don't treat us well. You know, we're, we're going to attempt to undermine that. And I know that there's some players that won't like that because, oh, this is my spell. It's my thing. It should just work. But the ask there is that when it's your turn in combat that you get eight times as many actions and things to do and time spent resolving your business, yeah, I think it's perfectly reasonable to go, you have to treat these things not as disposable uh, nothings, but as the spirits of animals that your character presumably gives a crap about. Mm -hmm. And not treat them as disposable things. Well, yeah, you know? I mean, they're not—they're not just video game icons or avatars that will just spawn away like yeah, when yeah. you're done with them. I mean, like like you said, I mean, these are coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. They have a life that you're pulling them from. Oh, certainly, and certainly. they will yeah, have yeah. to go back to. Yeah, they don't want to go presumably. back. Presumably. Yeah. So those are like role playing restrictions you can put on the conjure spells, and it can be you know that might prevent certain abusive behaviors by uh, by the party, but in terms of just like the mechanics mm -hmm. of conjure spells if you've got a lot of them use average die rolls there are options in the dmg for how to handle mobs mm -hmm. how to handle uh, large groups of creatures attacking at once mm -hmm. uh, sly flourish has a mob attack calculator where you basically input the number of uh, individual creatures in a particular mob and it will tell you like factor in everything every, factoring in everything will tell you okay here's how many of them would have hit go ahead and apply damage for that Right, right. And you don't even roll, you just know, okay, well, I'm attacking with however many creatures, then this many of them will automatically hit, and they do will take average damage. Boom. Maybe you give each member of your party some of your animal companions to control so that uh, it's it's not a, hand, a hassle for, every, for just one person to kind of share the load. Well, yeah, especially, you know, if you're getting wolves. You right, yeah, each yeah. of them a wolf. Uh-huh, yeah, exactly. power tactics rocking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be that, you know, you split up the wolves amongst the party members or, or whatever it is, right? If it's in a, a battle situation, you know, most CR8, or sorry, <laughs> eight CR one quarter monsters, you know, there's a lot of low-level AOEs that are going to, take those out. Yeah, which, which is why you spread them out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Not to mention targeting the caster to For break their concentration. concentration. Yep. That's all. That's that's usually. That's a big one, right? Like, I've seen that happen in every edition of D&D, that there are significant numbers of summoning monsters. I think the best way around this is summoning one creature. And if it were me, if I had my druthers, the conjure spells would summon a creature. You get the one, and you, you can't really... You could be have, it could be anywhere from CR one quarter to two, but you don't necessarily get all that many extra 
actions just just for the uh, just for the spell. That's the big one that I saw on time and again. Conjure spells, um, you know, animate objects, similar similar situation. Any more in the slow down the game uh, category? We had people mention guidance, and I think that's just one of those where uh, you know if you've got players who don't remember that they could potentially have guidance on every roll, and your cleric player isn't handy with a D4 to hand them or roll themselves. Yeah then that's that's on the players and you just as a dungeon master it is well within your right to say sorry that we are past that role like if, yeah. if you wanted to stack inspiration and guidance but i trust me it happens all the time oh the bardic player was doing something else oh wait you could have had inspiration on that or you could mm -hmm. have had this and oh yeah have guidance up. have guidance up that mm -hmm. it's one of those things where you know you can be a, a real just like uh stickler for the rules and no this is when you have to declare this ability you know, it's got to be before they roll etc but for me, I just am, it's about speed. It's like, if you guys mm -hmm. want those things, then pay attention. Personally, for me, if a cleric's casting guidance all the time, and that's that's a regular part of the game, I would prefer that they remember that. Yes, because absolutely. Because you're having to cast the spell. And it's concentration. You're having to maintain the concentration. Yep. So you should be there to be like, oh yeah, you're going to go off and sneak? Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to cast guidance on you there. Right. And as they go off and sneak, you go ahead and roll the d4. Okay, add two to that. And, and it's weird because some players are, are particular about die like dice that are that they're rolling oh, yeah, yeah. or that they're meant to roll yeah and like if you cast guidance it's like no i'm rolling the deal no, roll it's yeah. like well they cast <laughs> the spell though i am of the same opinion especially if you're dealing with a player who who seems to be forgetful of the buffs they have mm -hmm. on them or available to them yeah uh, or you you know the, the converse of that is the cleric player who forgets that guidance is a concentration spell and not everybody can have it mm -hmm. and you know it doesn't really do much for group checks. Maybe you just give it to the person with you know no proficiency or something. Close down the game a little. It's an extra die adding. Yeah, I don't know. I've always seen it as the completely out of combat. You know. Yes. You, you put it. You cast it on the rogue all the time. Sure. He's yeah, the yeah. one sneaking ahead. He's the one picking the locks. He's the one making the perception checks away yeah. from everyone. Yeah. And so it's I don't know. To me, that's just kind of like a, a standard thing for that. Guidance is one. Any, you know, any of those kind of things. Um, and then the other one that people mentioned as sort of slowing down the game was moonbeam and by extension flaming sphere. Things that summon a small area of, of damaging effect and it'll usually have some kind of wording that says when the target first enters the effect or starts their turn mm -hmm. and the edge case is my druid who goes right before the enemy cast a moonbeam on top of that enemy they have just entered it yep. so they're going to take damage and they have they the start of the their turn. turn so they're going to take damage many of these spells like the confusion that seems to come around them is just it seems to be like of reading the description and not taking it literally. Yeah. Like assuming that there's some kind of hidden or, or like I'm not interpreting this right. Mm -hmm. When time and again they tell us that the language of fifth edition is supposed to be natural and plain and straightforward. Yep. Does it say these are the two conditions? And then yeah, it doesn't matter if they happen in the same round. It doesn't matter. Now, change it if you want, right? Mm -hmm. If you think it's too much for the druid to sit with a moonbeam and run it back and forth across a line of enemies, then maybe they you know, can only be subject to it once per turn, which would mean they're subject to it on the druid's turn and then on their turn. I think maybe that slows down the game more for people having to look up the rules. What does it do? When is it triggered? How does it work? Although if you can properly work a flaming sphere down a corridor oh, yeah. with a melee base caster, I did that with my blade singer. Yeah. And let me tell you, it yeah. is an amazing tool to A, control the funnel and flow if you put it right in front of you so they have to go around you and they can't surround you because yeah. they don't want to be right in front of you. Yeah. And then you have fighters on either side of you. I've done it. Yeah. And it's amazing how Long you times. can just use it as the vanguard and uh -huh. plow through uh, a group of, uh, a mob of enemies like that. Um, but again, it takes a, 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 an acute understanding yeah, of yeah. When, it's, when it's called into play and, Certainly. And, and not overused. Not overused and everybody being on the same page about mm -hmm. it and things like that. Yeah. So, uh, too good to pass up. Oh man. These, what, do, these, what do you got? Because there's a lot of them. These are the big ones. I think even my list it doesn't even cover, you know, cover most of them. The ones that I saw as being big, too good to pass up, everything from Eldritch Blast and Fireball to Mending, mm -hmm. Prestigitation, Mage Hand, and, uh, of course, Healing Word and Healing Spirit ended up uh, a lot of good, too good to pass up list. Fly was another one. A lot of people mm -hmm. who were, a lot of DMs who seemed to be frustrated by flight, even, you know, whether it was permanent flight by uh, Aarakocra or, um, you know, the fly spell. And then Pass Without Trace is another one. I, I can see Pass Without Trace being uh, a problem spell for some DMs just because mm -hmm. it's really good. <laughs> you know, it extends the benefit to others. Yeah, well, like it's that. really good, but that's, I mean, that's why the bad guy hires a seer. 
Sure, like, yeah. You know, yeah. they hire a seer who scries specifically using magic to find them. Yeah. Pass Without Trace to me is one of those great spells that are absolutely great until you start getting up against enemies that can cast like third, fourth, fifth level spells. Yeah, yeah. And then by then your villain should be really good at like seeing through that kind of thing. It, it allows for the whole party to engage in stealth. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, it's like, yeah, it's a good group, but plus 10 can't be tracked through natural means. Like that's really good, but it's also concentration and the radius on it's not that particularly big. Yeah. So you got to you have to be clumped up, making you susceptible to AOE type attacks. Scrying fry, baby. Scrying fry. <laughs> but it's also like, it doesn't render you invisible. You know, yeah. you, uh, the, the person in heavy armor is still gonna have disadvantage on their stealth check. It's not even like group invisibility, which I'm not even sure they have any. I mean, like you can upcast invisible, but there's mm -hmm. not like the old you know, 15 foot radius invisibility yeah, globe. Yeah. This one's one where I can see. If you've got, if, especially if you are using the monster manual uh, stats, like there's really no way that a, a baseline monster has a hope of, of detecting mm -hmm. a group with Pass Without Trace, especially not stealth focused characters with Pass Without Trace. So yeah. it does feel a little bit unfair uh, in that sense. And to me, the solution is to just include uh, high perception uh, guard creatures you know, perhaps with special senses, blind sense, tremor sense, see invisible, that kind of thing. Except that this concentration-based second level spell is there to facilitate everyone sneaking and not just like some people. Yeah. In that sense, I, I see this one as like, I'll accept it, it's good buff, but I'm not gonna take it every time because it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's situational that way at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but like some of the some of the cantrips though, like 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 you said, like mending uh -huh. or mage hand. Yeah. I mean, mage hand is is a is a cantrip. I think almost every single spellcaster I make, yeah. I usually end up picking mage hand. I mean, it's a very useful like just being able to pick things up and manipulate them at range is really useful. It's useful in a place where you don't know where danger is going to be coming from. Mm -hmm. If every time I have the option to pick this spell, I'm going to pick it because I feel like if I don't, I'm I'm shooting myself in the foot and, mm -hmm. and not taking it like doesn't that suggest it's just a little too good? Like if you always feel like you have to take this that like if you don't, I'm going to be screwed or or I'm not going to be able to to be a, a, as effective as I'd like to be, or, or it doesn't fit my idea of what a spellcaster is or something. Mm -hmm. Like that to me suggests that it's too good, you know? And, and I don't know how you'd change it because I think Mage Hands, you know. I don't think it's OP at all. I don't think it's OP. It's just, it's very good at the utility that it provides. And mm -hmm. because you have a limited number of con uh, of cantrip slots, yeah. it'd be nice to see other things in the cantrip. Yeah. Other than, especially those three, Mage yeah. Hand, Bending, uh, and prestidigitation. Presto is usually one of those. It, it, it's on the first. It's always the one that it usually makes the chopping block, as opposed to Mage Hand. Mm. Mostly because you can kind of, I don't know, you can kind of fake some stuff with Mage Hand. Like In some ways, yeah. Carrying lights and stuff. Oh you yeah, can, yeah. You can create like illusions uh -huh, in a uh -huh. way. Um, like you just dropping stuff or, you know, spark, <laughs> picking up like a thing of like gunpowder or something and sprinkling oh, it yeah, over yeah. to I'm kind sure. of create, you know, a, a distraction or carrying a torch and dropping it or blah, blah, blah. Mending is one of those that's like, when you need that character that can do that, uh -huh. there's nothing quite like it. Sure. Uh, if sure. anything, I would love to turn mending uh, into a more, less than a minute. Like I, I yeah. get I get the one minute casting time to keep it like out of combat. Uh -huh. Uh, but I don't know. I think uh, to me there should be a version that you can because oh, you then it, then it becomes a thing where uh, you got to do it in the in the heat of combat. Oh sure, sure, sure. Patch up um, something in the in the heat of combat kind of thing, or, yeah. or like patch up your shield or your armor or mm -hmm. something, yeah. or a door, a door like, while while you're trying to you know mm -hmm. hold off the enemy and mm -hmm. waves mm -hmm. of enemies. Yeah, I, I think like mending's one of those where when I think about it from a world building perspective, it's kind of like man, mending is sort of like a like. It'd be kind of like a cantrip that you would want, like, I might want this all the time, kind of, you know, like you could see how every, almost everybody could use it. My restriction for mending is that it, it doesn't just like restore a piece, like there's that, that are, you know, it, uh, the tear or the hole or the thing that it fixes can't be above a certain, uh, uh, you know, dimension in length or something. And, and I forget what it is. It's like a foot maybe or something. Mm -hmm. And I just, I say like, it, it's not just that it, it, it heals or mends a portion of, of a larger hole. It's like if you've got a giant, say, 
crack in your wagon or your wagon wheel is broken or something. You can't mend it back together. You're going to mm -hmm. go to a Wainwright. But do you have a hole in your shoe? Like, see, that's how I, that's how I look at mending. Is it's mm. the tinkerer's skill. It's yeah. for fixing pots and sharpening knives and, yeah. and, and things like that. It's folk magic. And if you're trying to over here, like, to, to say, patch up a, you know, a, a castle wall with it, mm -hmm. or, or a door to, that's been rent, or, right? Know. A door that's been rent, or trying to use it to, like, say, you know, uh, you know, fix something that's very valuable uh, or something. Then the magic's crude, right? Like, it's a cantrip. Come mm -hmm. on, it's like one of the first things that you might learn. It's the the craftsmanship for it is ugly and and utilitarian and. Mm -hmm. Especially if you don't know the, uh, you know, if you're not proficient in the the tools that you are trying to work the magic of, you know, without. Them. Oh yeah, like like something's up with your full plate and you're mending some straps or whatever, but you don't yeah. have you don't have the you blacksmith tools yeah, yeah. to fix it. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna have to do as best you can, mm -hmm. and um, it could even be that if you find it just too ubiquitous and too powerful, that the effects of mending are temporary. Mm -hmm. You know, that this on, this mending only lasts an hour or so. It's like fixing, it's like putting a patch on a flat. You know, oh yeah, you, you just you're trying to get to somewhere where you can get permanently fixed. Yeah, you know? or or I could see like um, with with mending specifically in like say armor, uh, maybe if armor doesn't have uh, the disadvantage on stealth. Yeah, when you mend it, well now it does now because it does. now it doesn't it doesn't move as much, so uh -huh. you're not as flexible in it. It maybe makes some weird noises because now they, those those pieces don't, yeah. you know, they don't flow together. Uh -huh. um, yeah. I, yeah, I could definitely you just glue two that. pieces together. Yeah, you just glue two pieces. You just like fused them together with quick magic. So, I, you know, there was someone else who uh, on Facebook who mentioned like that that cantrips in general are difficult. I mean, they, these three in particular they called out, but just in general it was difficult because if you're trying to run a low magic game, the presence of on-demand on magic like these three, like mending and prestigitation and mage hand, you know, firebolt or eldritch blast or guidance, you know that it makes it hard to run a low magic campaign and they felt sort of frustrated by that. And, and you know, to, to those people out there, I would just say like, your players might not like it, your players might not play, they might need to find new people, but it's perfectly reasonable for you to say, casters in this world do not have the kind of on-demand at-will magic that cantrips have. And I know that there's a lot of people out there who insist that everybody hated firing their crossbows in third edition as wizards. But to me, the on-demand magic of cantrips and the like, especially attack magic, fundamentally changes what a spellcaster is. And I can see, I share that view. Like, I don't mind cantrips. I don't, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think they're fine for the kinds of gaming I do with 5th edition. But I can definitely see for those people who are like, I, you know, this is a problem for me, not because I can't adjudicate it in the combat or I don't know what to do with it when someone casts it, but the very presence of it in my game world changes my game world in ways I don't like. Mm -hmm. And that's the case, then just be like, no, you you know, get the cantrips, or you get like, you know, your casting mod in cantrips a day. I'm on the fence about what are you like what are well, your thoughts? To me, like Eldritch Blast, it technically is the same damage output as Firebolt. Sure. But you have to make more attack rolls. So right. you have the possibility to attack more creatures, but you also have the possibility to miss and do less damage, right? right? Correct, yes. So I think that the upside of, of Eldritch Blast is offset by the fact that you're making multiple damage rolls. Yeah. So, you know, of course then the other side of that argument is, well, that's more chances for a crit. Certainly more chance for a crit, more chances um, to apply hex if you're To apply that, hex if you're doing that. Boost. But I think that I don't really have a problem with Eldritch Blast like some people do. Uh, they just don't like a caster that just does the one thing. I'm sympathetic to that, right? Because mm -hmm. that, it, to me, that does change the nature of the magic. If the magic is repetitive and on mm -hmm. demand, then to me, it, it's almost by definition not magical. I like Eldritch Blast because I think that having a solid attack cantrip for the Warlock kind of like solidifies them as a ranged damage dealer. Maybe yeah. not on par with say an archer or something like that. Yeah. But you soup up all, you know, you get all the invocations for it. You you really trick it out. Um, it, to me, Eldritch Blast is not too good to pass up. It's boring as shit. Yeah. It's just, it's it's not the, I don't necessarily equate it with like the spamming, you know, button. Uh, you know, I played mm -hmm. a mage in Warcraft, you spam the fire yeah. and ice spells in that one. It's force damage, so even though it's like the die type is the same as Firebolt, force is going to be edged out, edge out a little bit more in terms of like resistances that you'll meet. The fact that 
it seems like it's so easy to trick it out and make it so much better than any other attack cantrip. You really just need Agonizing Blast. Mm -hmm. But then you can stack on Eldritch Spear, you can stack on the Repelling Blast. Repelling blast and so now the, you're moving people 10 uh, feet with each one of those. <laughs> right, yeah. plus the, what's the one, I forget the one that's like it pulls them forward as well. Like, not a tracking blast. Uh, yeah, I can't yeah, remember the exact yeah. name. So you can push them around. No save on that either. It doesn't matter. Like Gargantuan Demon Prince, doesn't matter. Hit them with, I hit them with my Eldritch Blast four times and they're knocked back 40 feet. Yeah. And it's that that I start going like, well, I, I mean, so far every Warlock I've played with has, has done that, which means that from a DM's perspective, I am constantly seeing these bolts of, you know, these lasers flying all over the place. Mm -hmm. And it's just... A, a situation where I'm like, I'm, you know, there's other cantrips, there's other builds, there's other ways to play the character. It'd be interesting to see those. Yeah. And so that's why I kind of look at it as like I wouldn't take it away. I think it's an important part of the warlock. Yeah. I, see, <laughs> I'm the I'm the other way where I just like I finally figured out how I want to do my gunslinger. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Five E, yeah. uh -huh. and it's it's gonna be outlaw Josie Wells meets whatever. Uh -huh. it's the Saint of Killers, basically. I appreciate and am sympathetic towards the people who are like, listen, my fighter fights with their sword all the time. They I don't get worried about the fact that I'm constantly swinging a sword. Yep. My Spamming archer, that blade. Yeah, my archer's constantly using a bow. And I'd say, like, with the swords, at least, there is an opportunity for description and interaction because you're in melee with a combatant. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're, you and the DM are both on it about, like, okay, the orc swings, you duck, you, you know, you, you know, try to stab under the ribs, blocks it with the rib of the shield. Like, if it's a back and forth action sort of description like that, even if you're not rolling to hit, even if your dice are coming up stinkers you know <laughs> you can still have an engaging uh round whereas i feel like with the warlock like how many times like does it look different every time you use it like you would have to find some way of giving your descriptions a bit of energy and vigor mm -hmm. that could be fun but to me it lacks the vitality of a, of a melee combat so that's where i kind of draw the distinction there although i don't think anybody should give you crap if you are a warlock player for spamming eldritch blast because it is good and you have a lot of resources to trick it out, and it's kind of the workhorse of your spell repertoire. Well, yeah, I mean, so don't feel the, bad. The, the easy response is because it it's usually a fighter type. It's like, oh, uh, yeah. you gonna swing that sword again? Again? Yeah, yeah. You yeah. gonna use a different weapon every time? <laughs> so I'm just gonna play my character, and you play yours. Yeah, yeah. And let's yeah. all be on the same team. We've talked about healing word before in the past. I kind of get the problem with healing word. Although yeah. as a player, I love the fact that healing word has saved my ass on multiple occasions. Oh sure. Yeah, it sucks that you know, hey, at range, I can just pop someone up, uh -huh. right? But you telling me a that you know you pray to a god that will give you the power to smite your foes at a distance, but you have to touch your allies to heal them. Like, yeah. I, like this thing is, I get why it exists, and I think it should exist. Yeah. I also understand the problem with it. This is one of those where I, I'm in the same boat. Like, I get it. I, I don't think I would get rid of it. Yeah. I, I think the fact that it doesn't do a ton of healing is being overlooked by a lot of DMs who complain about it. Like, yeah. yeah, you only need one hit point to get back up there, but that depends on initiative order. And I'm really kind of one of those things where it's like, if you find that this is a problem for you, then break up your monster group so that they have multiple initiatives. So that you are going multiple times in a round of combat, yeah. and it's not like a big chunk of when the players go, and then a big chunk when you go. I don't mind that. I, I find that's a very fast and efficient way to do it. But, yeah. you know, initiative order in a in a cyclical-based initiative, it, it, it counts for a lot. And mm -hmm. you, you know, the cleric might pop up the barbarian with three hit points left and but the next round is the enemy's round or the next turn is the enemy's turn and they hit the barbarian it's gonna go down, down again you know it yeah. and so it, it's there is some strategy involved in it EMs really just place combat and dropping players or sorry characters in combat as like the be-all end-all of their you know metric for how well they're doing you know so they come back from they pop right back up like make it more difficult to do that give them an exhaust give them exhaustion for dropping a zero make Whoa. them keep their death saves if they any, you know? Yeah, that was going to be my first thing, is if this is a problem in your campaign, then adjust the death save mechanic, and you got to do a short rest to get rid of your death saves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Failures. And so, you know, hey, it sucks. Or just have more uh, responsive monsters. Once you do this once, then they're going to be like, oh, that guy heals, and yeah. that guy's almost dead. Let's focus our fire focus on our these fire. two people. Right, right, right. You know, and make sure that he can't do that, make sure he stays dead. Like, yeah. your monsters are have some intelligence yes and so you should use it you should use it and one common thing that i saw at least when people who were sort of like i you know this spell frustrates me because my players always use it like that tells me more about 
how you create encounters necessarily than how the players are doing. And, mm -hmm. and that's, it. to me, and sorry if it sounds harsh, that is a DM problem because the DM is the one who is preparing encounters in such a way that the players are able to develop standard operating practices yeah. and, and have like set strategies. Like I always open with a banishment, another too good to be true or too good to pass up type spell. You should have a villain <laughs> sorcerer sitting there with a counter spell waiting, uh, especially yeah. if they've interacted with this party before. Yes. You know, they know that the second a player drops and that cleric starts casting, that's probably going to be a healing word counter spell. Probably that. Yeah. They, you know, there's at least uh, three or four goblins that are just like, trained with their bows on them waiting for the cast. Those are in game ways to kind of handle that. Uh, of course, the other way is to just say like, hey, this spell's really messing up the way that I run combats and games. Like, m you know, we can either ban it or what I might do is take uh, every, you know, take every spell that's not in the basic list that comes, you know, for free with fifth edition and be like, all of those spells, if you want them, like you're gonna have to find them. Like you're gonna you're gonna have to go out and quest for that prayer or that scroll or that whatever mm -hmm. uh, as a way to kind of control those problem spells. I'm thinking a healing spirit. Uh, I, I think healing spirit is fine. My opinion on healing spirit is that you should read James Egg's article in uh, D and D Beyond where he talked about all the different ways he would fix healing spirit and like what was wrong with it. And it's like a really great uh, just takedown of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I don't as an out of healing. Or as an in-healing spell, I think it's really cool. You create like this zone that players can walk through and get a little bit of healing. And that's kind of cool to have some fast in-combat healing like that. Yeah, it, yeah. it really becomes a problem outside of healing when you can summon the zone and your party can just keep walking through it to each get 10d6 uh, worth of healing. Mostly the uh, fixes for that limit the amount of times that the healing spirit can be tapped into mm -hmm. and, and or require the druid to use their reaction to extend the benefit of the healing magic to the person. Um, so those are the things for healing spirit. Uh, I don't know about the others. Well, maybe we'll get back to some of the too good to pass up because there's other ones I won't make sure we talk about. I was surprised to see that a lot of people mentioned find familiar as a spell that makes the game less fun for them and they find it uh, boring and, and, and specifically the solution of just kill the familiar isn't working for them. You know, I, I do think that if you're letting familiars just run all over your dungeons and it's like a problem for you, you know, mm -hmm. like the PCs are learning too much information about them or whatever. You can off a familiar, you know, they tend to not have a lot of hit points. It takes relatively a lot of gold uh, at low levels to bring them back. Inconvenience uh, to not have them immediately, but mm -hmm. it, it seems like it's the, I can uh, send this small creature out into the world where they're gonna be small and un, you know unobtrusive yeah, and conspicuous. And, yeah, and learn all about this dungeon. Again, if it's happening every time, then it might be time to, I don't know, include denizens in your dungeon that specifically feed on familiar type animals or hunt them down or like. I mean, yeah, if, you, if you're in a dungeon and you see a rat or a snake going by, you might want to try to kill it and eat it. Sure, you might want to kill it. It might be, yeah, it might be those goblin children's job to catch rats for the stew pots or maybe mm -hmm. that's why they brought in a goblin rat hound, you mm -hmm. know, just to keep those kind of things under control or that's what, <laughs> you know, yeah, there's well, all kinds of things, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I see, I see this as probably a problem for other players that want to play rogues or rangers. Yes. Because yeah, now definitely. the wizard has you're stepping on their toes yeah you know? yeah yeah and and that's the kind of thing where I, I might say like all right well you can't like the familiar can't ride in the rogues hood the familiar can't well, that's you know. what I've always like yeah. tried to press for in games it's just like that's the way for the party to tag along with the rogue doing yes. the scouting so they know immediately if something is wrong now the familiar is kind of protected uh, from the rogue I, and I, again like the summoned creature spells how often is your familiar gonna want to do this like this is one of those things where when, when you think about it, it, it's the rules as they are presented would suggest that like this is yours to control, this is yours wherever, but this, the ability is also pretty clear. The spell is also pretty clear. It is an extra planar spirit that inhabits a body created for it. It's not, a, it's not just an animal. It has a, a higher level of, of being and intelligence and I think it's perfectly reasonable for <laughs> Radigan to turn around to the pointy-hatted wizard and go, no, you're gonna go walk around in the dark this time, Mr. I Have Invisible. Just be like, last time I got pierced by a bunch of, you know, uh, arrows and was roasted alive. You know, like, I'm just not gonna do that again. Yeah. And to treat the conjured creatures that your party has not as disposable things, mm -hmm. but as the living beings that they are. And they might not like that. Your players might not like it, but it is a way of preventing that abuse.
Yeah. And I mean, that's just, that's, that's just simple t simply taking it for granted. Yeah. Like, like, oh, I get this, I can just do whatever I want with it. And yeah. it's like, wow. Yeah, yeah. They there's, wouldn't let, yeah. There's some give to this take. There's some give to that take. that yeah. You couldn't just boss around hirelings in, in you know, old school D&D either. You had to convince them. You had to pay them. You had to uh, woo them in a way. And mm -hmm. if you didn't, then they might leave. They might take your stuff. They might yeah. try to kill yeah. you in your sleep. Yeah, go into the dungeon. We'll have dinner ready. Yeah, yeah. sure. Back at the tavern after they steal all your shit. Yeah. I can definitely see that. I Looking at, at from that perspective, like, yeah, if I was a DM and I and I had been working on these dungeons and and wanted the exploration of the dungeon to be a big part of it, mm -hmm. I would be bored. And, and, you know, if the first hour of every dungeon consisted of the party sitting around outside while a sparrow flew around and telepathically communicated with a wizard. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if that's the case, then you just, when you start the session, be like, here's your map. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. Is if it becomes standard operating procedure, then you then you skip the boring parts. And you go, yep, you guys are doing the same thing. All right, here's what you're, you know, all right, let me roll a D20. That's how many rounds they get or something, I don't know, before they're found. Uh, and this is how far, you know, they make it. Here's the map. But you don't know what all this is. You don't have time to check it out. You don't know which way to go or what to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's plenty of other ways to get the party a map as well that it could be you know, just as interesting. I never had that problem because I have players that want to, that want to, their fine familiar is a fucking flump. So <laughs> yes. I, don't, I don't get bored with, with yeah. fine familiar or subsequent flock of familiars. I would include knock and arcane lock in boring. And just because they're they're the light switch sort of spells, you you do them and they either work or they don't. Mm -hmm. well, the way I kind of look at it is like uh, someone was mentioning on 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 one of the social media platforms, like reduce was a big problem for them because oh. players kept like reducing doors and things like that. And I was thinking in the same terms of like, well, it's kind of like arcane lock. You keep just or, or knock, sorry. You just keep opening them. And then that got me thinking of just like if doors are such an important obstacle in your dungeon then just don't have one kind. Have like 20 different kinds of doors. Mm -hmm. Like if, if, and I'm thinking about, the more I thought about this, the more I was like, well, you'd have to have, like knock is a powerful spell. If knock can open almost any container, lock, chest, whatever, it makes a big noise, but it's clearly capable of manipulating everything from uh, simple latches to complex locking mechanisms. That's a lot of, to ask for one spell to carry, so, if I was going to do an adventure that featured a lot of lock picking, a lot of dungeon crawls in which doors are obstacles, or a lot of like breaking and entering, then I might just be like, knock is like a dozen different spells. There's, this is the spell that opens, a, you know, a French door. This is the spell that, you know, that opens a double uh, ranch style doors or something. You know, mm -hmm. This one gets a deadbolt open. This one will, uh, you know, undo a chain on the other side. And it's, what, you're, what you've got then, uh, is all of these very specific, very different ways to open the doors in, say, a dungeon. Maybe you have different keys that open them, or, or the spells are the keys, you know, in some ways. And, and, and maybe one of them is a, you know, musical lock, and the other has other, you know, things going on. And it's varying up your environments that will make a lot of these spells less problems. So like fly, why is fly a problem? Well, it's probably because you're using too many environmental obstacles that rely on limited movement for the party to be challenged. And it's not that you should never include those, even if you have characters that can fly, but it's just like, they're gonna get around to those. It, you know, if you don't want them to, then put them in confined places. Have it be that, that flying in this particular part of the wilderness is really dangerous, yeah. you know? There's always uh, high winds and storms. There's <laughs> always high winds and storms. Or there's like, like large predators. Right, there's like those <laughs> huge sized eagles around here that will just snatch your flying characters right out of the air because they're better flyers than them. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or, you know, giant spiders that weave webs in the trees that, that catch these kind of things. Or, yeah. yeah you know, like, Funnel like, webs made out of an <laughs> Right. Uh, Unless you look at them just so. A <laughs> uh, uh, titan, titana tree boa who, you know, they just sits in a tree and, and waits for a flying character to come by before it snatches them out of the air. Like, make the environments varied. Make the combats varied. Make it so that banishment isn't the first choice and only choice that your characters go to. Or that fireball wins every fight before they can get to it. Or, or a hypnotic pattern becomes just so devastating to winning an encounter. You vary those things up by looking at the limitations of the spells. What's their range? What Do they have line of sight? What's the area of effect? Like, can I design an encounter area that is gonna neutralize those things 
and then have enemies who are used to fighting in that encounter area fight. And now the party is forced to use other magic. Also, this fifth edition, that the whole point of the game is to tell stories of, of heroes con you know, conquering and overcoming their obstacles. So like you're kind of fighting against the system at that point. That's where I would start. Look at the limits of the spells and then design specific encounters around them if you're having that much trouble. What else you got there, Jim? Uh... I'm sure there's a lot. I, I mean, there is there is a lot. I, I wanted to talk about just a couple more things. I know we're running long on the show, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, some people were saying, like, well, there's a lot of spells that I just never see prepared, like the Invisibility or Witch Bolt, um, Nistel's Magic Aura, Magic Weapon. Those, those are some that I saw. And, and to me, it's like, you will see Nistel's Magic Aura pop up in your games when the presence of and identifying the correct aura of magic items becomes a big deal. If you are trying to steal magic mm -hmm. items, then masking their magic aura is very important. If you are trying to pass off certain magic items as something that they aren't, or just mundane items as magical, you're gonna want Nistel's magic aura. Like if you are an assassin who wants to make sure that they are not spotted using their disguise self spell or their magic weapons, Nistel's magic aura is gonna be really helpful. You can reveal information about the world through detect magic, uh, and Nistel's magic aura counters detect magic. It, it makes people read as different kinds of creatures so that they don't set off, say, certain glyphs of warding, right? If you have a glyph of warding keyed to Dragonborn, and your Dragonborn Nistel's magic auras themselves to detect as an elf, then that's gonna fool the glyph of warding. It's gonna fool other spells that rely on identifying parts of the target and having that trigger them. You will see an invisibility, you know, see invisibility will see use in your campaign when invisible foes become too much of a problem for your players mm -hmm. or, or, scrying foes. or scrying foes or something. Yeah. Magic weapon yeah. will see use in your campaign if you don't hand out magic weapons. That's just sort of how you arrange for those spells to be valuable. You know, someone was saying, I never see charm type magic used in my campaigns. And just there's something about the way they were writing it that made it seem like what well, it sounds like it could be wrong, but it sounds like you have a lot of very combat heavy like go in guns blazing style games and that your players like that charm is a subtle spell it, yeah. and all type of charm magic it's not for combat it is for the courtroom the restaurant the the bedroom getting the, around, the town <laughs> getting guard. around town guard mm -hmm. it's for the indirect approach it's yeah. for uh, wizards who who don't want to get their hands dirty and just want to subtly manipulate things and if you're not running that kind of game then those spells are not going to be valuable that would be my first answer for anyone who's like why doesn't people why don't people in my games <laughs> prepare x spell then you need to not look at the player as the source of the blockage but instead consider what you might be doing as the dm to not create the kind of conditions that you want to see for the players to cast those spells see invisibility that's that's one that would have saved my story bound crew a hell of a lot of <laughs> headaches it's not concentration and it's not concentration either come on neither is dark vision right so many meetings that they had yeah like that. it sucks for them they could have spotted that scrying sensor <laughs> it was always there too now, if you're curious about what our thoughts on Counterspell, go and check out our Abjuration episode where we kind of go over it. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is it has limits. You use Sly Flourish's sort of descriptions to jazz up uh, yeah. you know, the Counterspell, but it is a fun stealer. Like, let's make no, let's not mince words. Spells are not being cast mm -hmm. if they are countered. <laughs> you know, and for many uh, players, you know, they have no problem doing it to the DM, but when it's turned on them, they, you know, yeah. it's, it's a problem. So, yeah, if, you, if it's not fun for your game, get rid of it. D&D's done fine for four editions without it, and it will do fine for five. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. WebDM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the Web Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our interview with Dale Kingsmill of Monarchs Factory YouTube channel. WebDM is a proud partner of D&D Beyond, our favorite supplement for our D&D games. We've got a link to them in the description. Go and check them out. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, we've got games on Twitch every week and they're archived on our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. Thanks for watching. Because then you could add a, a cacophony underneath us, right? It's a din of... You can, like, oh, the, 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 the soundtracks from the Harry Potter fights. Trav, I'm going to need oh, you to... Stuff I out. need you to do something. Oh, yeah. All right. 
And I need some balls of paper. Oh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm getting the hard one out of the oh, way first. Shit, 